That's what we're talking about today, joy. Yes, joy. How many have their Christmas shopping done? How many haven't started? Okay, all right. Maybe that's why you're not feeling the joy. Okay, <laughs> understand, understand. We all, we all face that. The struggle is real. I'll tell you what, what do you think of when you hear the word joy? Because I get a mental picture. Every time I get a mental picture, when I, when I think of joy, I picture a young child's face. Like this one right here. I love this because this right here, to me, just, exactly, right? It's like somebody has just taken a blanket out of the dryer and wrapped this swaddling little tot. And you know what I mean? It's just look at him. He's just so, it's like, mm. Some of you wish we could take a blanket out of the dryer right now and wrap you in it this morning. I did turn the heat on. You know, if y'all tied a little bit more, we turn it up some. I'll just see. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. When you hear the word joy, what is it that, that comes across your face? Because I, I just Googled it, and this is what came up, this next one. I love this. Because to me, this epitomizes, this show, there is somebody probably just off camera, like a mom and a dad tickling him right now. You know what I'm saying? And he's just, he's just exuberant with joy. Maybe your face, when you think of joy, is more like this one, which is probably my favorite one. Because I can't tell if he's overflowing with joy or if he's hatching some diabolical scheme, <laughs> taking over the world or something. Everybody has something different when they think of joy. Everybody thinks of something. What is it that makes you want to shout for joy? Last week, when you reached under your chair before you left, and there was cash all over this room in envelopes for you to go be, I saw joy on a lot of y'all's faces, and it was awesome. And you went out and blessed. I'm going to share some of those stories. What is it about joy that makes you want to hold aloft your Diet Coke and shout dilly dilly? What is the joy that overflows? Because there is something hopefully in your heart that comes to mind when you picture and think of the word joy. Today we're talking about our journey of joy. Let me have my volunteer come up. We're going to light one more candle. Today is the candle of joy, and there's a lighter right there on top of the keyboard. We've lit two candles previously, hope, love, and today we light the candle of joy. Next week, we will be able to light the final candle before we get to the white candle, which represents Christmas Eve has come. And we are so excited. Awesome. Thank you, Corey. God bless you, buddy. Each time we light a candle, it should remind us we are one week closer to Christmas. This way, we don't just blow through it. I mean, so many times, Christmas comes and goes, and like on the 26th, I look at Amy, I'm like, what happened? It's like, I missed it. Man, I did it again. I was so busy. I was so focused on so many things. I got to do this. I got to do that. I got to buy this. I got to come here. We got to go to in-laws. Now we got to go to outlaws. Now we got to go over. We got to do all these things. And, and then you sit down and you go, I think I never engaged. Hopefully, you've been enjoying the Christmas devotional book. I've been loving it, going through the Christmas code. It has been so good. The kids have been reading it, and, and we've been sharing it just to force us to slow down, to stop and pause and know, man, we're on a journey. And this theme we're looking at is the star. And when we look at the star, what we're talking about is a star that not only drew people to Jerusalem 2,000 years ago or to Bethlehem, but a star that still draws wise men today. When we look at the star and we think God wrote himself into the script this week when we study this, and he became a part of it. He invaded time and space, took on flesh so he could identify with us. We don't serve a God that's distant and removed. He can't identify with us. We have struggles. You don't understand. You're perfect and holy. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> Jesus endured everything we did, yet he was without sin. And that is good news and great news. And I am so excited to talk about joy today. As we continue this story, today we focus on the journey that leads us to joy, not just joy. There's a lot of misunderstanding when it comes to joy. So if you're here today and you're a little down and out, maybe you're a little frazzled, or maybe you just look around and it just seems dark, and you can't quite cut through it, you are in the right place today. Today is for you because joy is the fuel that brightens our journey. It can light a fire. If those embers have grown cold, that's okay. You can admit that here. It's the potter's hand. It's safe here. You're allowed to admit that we all got struggles. And we're going to look at James in just a minute even. And we're going to talk about how do we have joy for this journey because it is so misunderstood. In fact, we often confuse the word joy for another word. You know what I'm talking about? Happiness. They are not the same thing not even close. They can coexist, but many times joy shows up in the least expected places. So today, we're going to set the context of one such scenario where joy invaded a dark night. 
Turn with me in your Bibles to Luke chapter 2, but don't read it yet, okay? Pull up your favorite smartphone app, Luke chapter 2, and just hold your place there. While you do that, let me welcome our online campus. Great to have you streaming with us today as well. In Luke chapter 2, just to set kind of what's, what's happening here this night, God is about to announce the greatest news the world has ever known. I'm talking not just mediocre news, not just, oh, that's nice, that's a nice church thing. No, no, this was the redemption of mankind. This is it. All things have been pointing to this moment. And God is going to do it in the most unexpected and unusual way. Think about this. If you haven't thought through this, this is going to blow your mind a little bit. God chooses to announce the birth of his son in the least convenient hour of the day, in the dark of night. Then he chooses to announce it in the least of all cities, a lowly village named Bethlehem that most of us would have never heard of had this event not happened. And to make it even more bizarre, he announces it to the least of all society, smelly shepherds. These are the lowest on the rung. They're good people, but they on the low, on the societal economic scale, man, they were just kind of looked over. People are like, shepherds, really? He's going to, now think about this. This is a group of people who are deemed ceremonially unclean, 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 you know, they, they, they didn't even want to be able to, to, to be dealt with. Jews didn't want to go near them because they had dealt with Gentiles. They'd sold sheep to them. They traded with them. They bartered. And so they were deemed unclean, okay? So think about this. Think of the irony. You ready for your hidden gem? God shows up and announces this news, not at the temple, not to the high priest, not to the scribes or the Pharisees or the Sadducees or anybody like that. He chooses to announce it to a group of people who aren't even allowed to worship in the temple. You don't think that caused heads to explode? Can you imagine those Pharisees reading their scrolls? Mm, what, what? What? God did what? He did what? He announced it to the smelly ship. <laughs> That's how Pharisees sound, if you weren't sure. I just wanted to say, you know, <laughs> true story. And, and I just pictured this, that their heads just, that can't be, steam shooting out of their ears. There's no way Yahweh God is going to announce it in a bizarre place at a bizarre time to some bizarre people. There's just no way it should come to the temple. Yet that's what happens. God chooses this incredible night. And then, to, to top it all off, if that's not enough, just to set the table, God chooses to do the birth announcement through an angel. An angel. There's just one problem with that. How do humans usually react when an angel shows up? Do they run up and give them a big hug? <laughs> they high-five them? They're terrified. Your Bible may even say they shook with fear or they trembled. They don't like, never do we see an angel show up and go, hey, y'all. <laughs> they don't do that. Almost every single time, without exception, except just a handful of, of scenarios, nearly every time an angel appears, his first words are, do not be afraid. Don't be afraid. They arrive, dazzling life. Don't be afraid. Get up, get up. They will fall down, acting dead. The humans are so in shock because of brilliant light, or they run. Yet God chooses to show, to show this message through an angel, and then a company of angels. It is incredible what he does. He shows up, and he says, do not be afraid. And he says that to Mary, to Joseph, to the shepherds. They all hear the same message, and you need to hear this message, church. Do not be afraid. Don't be afraid about anything going on in your life. And you're going to hear the reason why. The shepherds give us a perfect example. Okay, let me set this pattern here. These shepherds were not cowardly. They weren't weak, sheepish people. <laughs> sheepish, pun intended. They weren't meek and mild people that had issues being outdoors. They were a burly group of people. They lived outdoors. They lived in all the seasons and rough conditions. It wasn't like us today. They didn't have Cousin Eddie's RV rolling up where they could hang out in it. They didn't do all these modern conveniences, this glamorous camping that all the raids is glamping, as it's called now. None of that. They lived outdoors in that kind of icy weather when it was bad, in the heat when it was really, really bad. When burglars and prowlers and, and predators would come up, they had to sleep with one eye open. They were strong men. They were not to be messed with. In fact, on this night, they had numbers on their side. So we have all these strong people, and the angel shows up, and check out what happens. The angel appears in the sky, and suddenly these strong men go weak in the knees. Weak in the knees. 
What is happening? And they tremble with fear. Follow along. Read with me here, starting in verse 9. So the angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were moderately, lightly scared. They were terrified. You don't use that word unless you truly are frightened. But the angel said to him, here's the first words, don't be afraid. <laughs> don't be afraid. Don't run. Don't panic. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You'll find a baby wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. So the angel shows up and has good news of great joy that will cause joy for all the people comes to this group of people, and the world's greatest birth announcement, before they could get to the good news, notice what the angel has to do. The angel has to help the shepherds get over their fear. Did you catch that? Before they could embrace the joy, God had to do a work, and they had to squash their fear. Ooh, this is for somebody. This is not even in my notes. Somebody here needs to hear today. You have fear in your life, and it is robbing you of joy. You with me? That is powerful. God has shows up before the good news can come, before they can erupt with joy when we read what happens next. The shepherds had to help them get over their fear. And the angel says, don't be afraid, okay? Read on with me, verse 13. Suddenly, a great company of heavenly hosts appeared. Now there's more showing up. And they're praising God, saying, glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth, peace to those whom his favor rests. And that's our starting point today for our journey. We're going to look at joy, and I want to focus on three different aspects of joy, because I think we often misdefine this word. I think when we hear it, we immediately think happiness. And here's, here's the myth that I want to dispel right from the get-go. Joy is not the absence of suffering. Joy is not the absence of pain. It's not the absence of anything bad going on in your life. But that's how we think about it. We think, be honest, for us to experience joy, we think things have to be going pretty well in our life right? For us to experience joy, everything has to be going just so, so that everything lines up. And then, and only then, Lord, will I feel joyful. If you wait for everything to be perfect in your world before you feel joy, it will never happen. Can I get an amen? That is just life. We live in a fallen world. Can I get a dilly dilly? Wow, that's awesome. This is the fallen world we live in. This is, this is showing us that our happiness is related to happenstance. That's different than joy. Joy is that grin beneath the surface that is always there, good times or bad, knowing that in the end, God will make things right. You don't have to worry about your salvation. You don't have to worry about at the end, he redeems mankind, and he redeems the world, and things will be straight. All, happiness depends on things going well. It happens to be happenstance. It's just one of those things that, yeah, in order for me to feel happy, this has to go. That's not joy. Joy isn't necessarily the absence of pain, and it's not the absence of sadness. In fact, these emotions can, be honest, and often do frequently intermingle. There are times where you feel pain and joy at the same moment. Let me show you what I mean. There are some great organizations in this world doing incredible missions overseas, and one of the things they do is they go to impoverished villages and they put out wells of fresh water. They dig them or they bring them or they bring the life straws and it is a beautiful thing. And when those people show up, the face radiates joy. It is incredible what happens. Their world is turned upside down for the better overnight. And you see in not just this village, but this next one, where they are so happy and the joy is overflowing on their faces because it is a until this moment full of death and more, more lives are lost due to this kind of problem and, and, and disease and drinking water and, and it's a hardship on moms and kids who are the ones who always have the responsibility to go hunting and finding and hauling back water. And then you look in this next photo and you see the joy overflowing of something that we take for granted, something that we flush clean water. Let that sink in. So here's the amazing thing about joy that is so bizarre. Notice the exuberant smiles on these faces. For them to feel this kind of joy, did all their problems disappear? Not at all. Just one of them did. Now think about this. They still have to cope with hardship. They still have to cope with hunger, with pain, with disease, but they are filled with joy in the midst of this because clean water has changed a part of their life, and they have gratitude. 
And that's the strange thing about joy. Our natural reaction is for us to think joy can only come when pain is absent, but that's not the truth of it. The Bible comes and says, in this fallen world, joy and pain will, in this fallen world, until he redeems it, will exist side by side. Are you aware of that? Do we realize that? I think these two emotions intermingle so many times, sometimes in the same day. You ever have one of those days where it's just like, whoa, yeah. I mean, it's just awesome. You got front row tickets to the Striper concert. You are so fired up. And then you get tragedy. Phone call comes, turns your world upside down. In the same day, here, here. And then maybe something phenomenal happens or God blesses you. Or maybe you just get in connection with the Lord and you restore your joy. And you've done this through the day. These two can co Mingle. Sometimes it's a mix and a juggle. But here's the hidden gem. Sometimes pain and struggles magnifies joy. If you don't believe that, talk to someone who has walked through the valley of the shadow of death. And look at their joy. Look at those people. Look at the spouse who has buried a child. And you see peace. And somehow they can smile and still have joy because they know this is not goodbye. This is just fare thee well. I'll see you in the morning. People who have such deep-rooted maturity. So what about you? Let me ask you this. When the angel shows up and his first admonition is don't be afraid, what circumstances in your life going on right now are causing you to experience fear? What is it that you are afraid of? As you do a little inventory in your mind here, where is the pain of life starting to overshadow the presence of joy? chances are something has flashed through your mind. And you know, you know where your world feels like it's spinning out of control. You know, guess what? Here's the cool part. That is exactly where the angel shows up and says, don't be afraid about that. Do not fear. He's not saying don't face reality. He's saying do not be afraid. The message isn't just for shepherds. The message is for us of the church today. Don't be afraid. You don't have to fear. There is good news of great joy, and it changes everything. I love this. In the book of James, James takes this concept a step further. And he says something that, quite honestly, I'm just going to lay it out there, sounds contradictory. He sounds so like he's been off his rocker a little bit, okay? I'm, we're going to read this together. Follow along. Notice what he says in the first sentence. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, when you face tri trials. Trials of many... James, I think you got the wrong part here. Consider it pure joy when you win the sweepstakes. But what... It, consider... When you face trials... Does that really say that? Read on. Because you know that the testing of your faith produces what? Perseverance. Oh, yeah. That's how I feel about it, too. <laughs> Perseverance. Mm-hmm. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete. Oh, wow. Not lacking anything. Wow. Really, James? <laughs> Consider it pure joy? This is easier said than done, but this is the mark of a spiritually mature believer. You want to take your faith to the next level? There's a goal right there. How are you doing with it? And that's deep. Pastor, I can't believe you're hit. We're supposed to be lighting candles and singing happy stuff today. <laughs> We're getting there. But this message is so powerful. This sounds totally contradictory, but I want to get one thing straight right away. Hear me. This is not a suggestion for you to fake it. This is not a claim to fake it till you make it, fake it till it gets better. This is not a call to plaster on an artificial smile and say everything's great when you're dying inside. This is not that. This is an encouragement to me and you that even in the midst of hardship, that we pull back and we take the longer, broader view of this and we see very clearly that God can help us grow and he is maturing us and people are watching us to see how we handle this so that we can be an inspiration to others, so that we can say, I've been there, I emulate with you, let me give you a hand up, can I weep with you? Can I weep with those who weep? Can I rejoice with those who rejoice? This is incredible. We take the broader view. We have a mature faith. I love how C.S. Lewis puts it. He says this. He says, hardships often prepare ordinary people for an extraordinary destiny. Wow. Well, that starts to put it in a little bit of a different view for me. And while this isn't easy, life can be coexisting with joy. And as we grow in our relationship with God, we experience this joy. We understand if you're a believer and you pull back, that there is more going on than your pain. Hear me. There is more going on in your world right now than the suffering. 
There is something going on, unseen, a deeper reality where God is at work, the unseen spirit flowing within you that can, if we in turn to it and we embrace it, that can nourish us, renew us, lift us up to cleanse us, just like that clean water that we saw in that village. Bring life in the middle of darkness, death, depravity, upset times, turbulent world conditions, if we turn and embrace joy. So what does that look like, Pastor? I hear you. It sounds cool. I'm with you. I'm pro-joy, in fact. I'm all about it. But what are the benefits if I do this? How do I daily live this reality? The first benefit we see when we look at Scripture is so powerful to me, and that's this. Joy brings connection with others. Don't miss this part, okay? This gets into koinonia and a deeper worshiping with the Lord. Remember those pictures of joy on the, on the faces of all those people in those villages? Did you notice something peculiar about each one of them? Nobody. Not one. Not one photo was a single person alone. It wasn't just one person being blessed and excited with joy and then the whole village. It was the entire town. The entire village was blessed. Nobody went through this alone. That's how it is with the good news of Christ coming at Christmas. That is how, the good news is for everyone. The life-giving joy that we have is supposed to bubble up like a well and flow over to others. We're supposed to connect with others, to rejoice with those who rejoice to weep with those who weep, to lift people up. Everyone has a chance to embark on a journey of joy because Jesus came for all. You need to hear that. When he showed up, the promise of good news, it wasn't just for the Jews. It wasn't just for the smelly shepherds. It wasn't even just for Americans. It was for everybody. God's joy is supposed to spill over. It's not supposed to be contained by geography. It's not supposed to be contained by governments or nationalities or races. It is for all who would receive him. I love the psalm in Psalm 96. The psalmist says this. Listen, listen to his joy. It's uncontainable the way he, he just rambles and goes on and on. He says, let the heavens rejoice. Let the earth be glad. That's not enough. Let the sea resound and all that's in it. Still not enough. Let the fields be jubilant and everything in them. That's not enough. Let the trees of the forest sing. Let them clap their hands. That's still not enough. Okay, let all creation rejoice before the Lord because he comes. Whoa, now that's a level of joy that honestly, I seldom reach. But that's my goal. That's my goal. When people see me, to go, man, I may not know much about that guy with the bald head, but he seems to have something different. He seems to have an unspoken joy brimming just beneath the turbulent waters. Listen to that song. There's hidden gold right there. Did you, did you miss that? Fear and pain will isolate us, but joy brings connection. Man, that's good. You need to write that down. That's not even in my notes. Fear and pain isolate us, but joy connects us. It brings us together. And joy of Jesus coming to all the earth connects us not only to each other, but it connects us to him, which leads us to a great question. If we're connected with him and we have joy, what is our response to joy? Oh, man. He always turns this. Pastor does this. He brings this thing where we got to do something now. Yeah. Here's the... Here's, here's, here's the fun part. Our response to joy, when joy shows up and interrupts our day, gladly, when it finally arrives in the middle of a valley of bleh, and it finally sets up camp, what do we do with it? How do we respond to this? How do, we, how do we balance this joy and this pain until Jesus comes? Because sometimes it's easy to embrace joy. But what about those days when our struggles and our fears and the pain and the bills and the medical issues kind of come in and overshadow that. What do we do then if I'm not feeling that kind of joy? Pastor, what do I do on those days when joy feels so far away, so distant that honestly, I'm just going to say it, I can't even think about connecting with God. What do we, what do, we do then? And how does joy help us? How does it benefit us? Well, that leads us to a very powerful truth. When you see what happened with the shepherds, and the wise men, their joy, even though things never changed around them in their day-to-day -day life, their joy led them to worship. Hmm. There's something deep going on here. The Bible will show you every time the appropriate response to joy is always worship. In fact, if you are struggling with joy this, this season, did you know that worship can jumpstart your joy? Worship 
can jumpstart your joy. Have you ever been down and out, come in here, and you sing, and for 20 or 30 minutes, we're at the throne, and the next thing you know, you feel like you could touch the face of God, and your problems, you know why? Because you got your eyes off of your problems, and you put them where they belong, on the problem solver. And it changed everything. I mean, even if it's just for that moment, that joy led you to worship. There's a beautiful song that I used to sing years ago called Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. What were my eyes focused on? His glory, his grace. And the things of earth began to grow strangely dim. Let me show you what I mean. Let's put this in real life. I have a ball here. Now, if I were to throw this ball, notice not one person jumped out of the chair with joy to chase that ball. Not one person. Can I have that ball back, by the way? Yeah, thank you, Roy. <laughs> but what if, thank you, buddy, what if I was around a dog and I threw this ball, whew, this is what you would see right here right? You know it. They would be transfixed on this ball. They would be so focused on it, the joy would be, you couldn't, you couldn't contain it. They would literally be flying off to go and chase this ball. <laughs> exactly, right? So I throw it. You could see them. You could see, it's that round thing, that sphere of delicious joy. I don't know why, but I got to go get it. And guess what they do? They come back so you can do it all over again and do it again and again. Nothing will stop them from going over or under or around or through to get to its goal. Oh, do you see it? You see where this is going yet? Oh, this is so perfect. The dogs even get this. Think about this. It is so fun to watch them when they fetch the ball and they bring it back. The lesson for us, they don't take their eyes off the ball. You know what they take their eyes off of? Everything else. They take their eyes off of all the distractions. They take their eyes off of everything else around, and they couldn't care less what was out there. All they want was that. They fixed their eyes on the prize before them, and they ran for it. They didn't care that they didn't get their adequate ejection in their hip that day. They didn't care that they didn't get their force-fed pills of allergies or whatever wrapped up in cheese like you're trying to fake them out or something. None of that mattered. They just wanted the goal. This is so beautiful. The Christmas story, when the angel shows up and announced good news of great joy, the entire host started to praise him. Everybody got it. And then they went and told everyone they met. It overflowed and it bubbled. Matthew tells us that the wise men responded with joy, and then they went to worship. And the shepherds did the same thing. Look at what it says here in Matthew 2.10. It says, when they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And then they bowed down and worshiped him. Joy led them to worship. That is the natural response to joy. Now do you see why it's so important that we don't look like we walked around being baptized in vinegar, drinking prune juice, and lost our best friend? How in the world do we expect the lost world to want what we have when sometimes, man, I don't even want what we have if we base it on the level of joy that we receive, on the level of love, on the level of generosity that we see? That's why last week was so important when you guys went out and, and it became a contagious thing. God's message of joy can penetrate deep and it can start to sweep away all these distractions and help us be drawn joyously towards God. Just like it did with these guys right here on the camel. It drew them in and it lifted them up and they jumped right into God's life-giving flow of joy. Worship does that for us. This is what Advent's about. I love what Peter says. This is one, one of the coolest verses. Uh, we won't look at it together, but I'll read it to you. First Peter 1, 8, and 9. And I love this because it's like Peter is almost calling in just believers. Almost like he's saying, hey, take a time out. Y'all come here. I want to share something with you. Listen to what he says. He says, though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you who do not even see him now, today, you still believe in him. You love him. You believe in him. And because such, you are filled with inexpressible and glorious joy. And it can't be taken away. For you are starting to receive the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Man, that is powerful. So if you're sitting here today and you're thinking, man, that's great. I, I want to experience this joy in my life. But the brokenness of my fallen world seems to be at such odds with the joy of Christ. 
How do I reconcile those things? How do I straddle this tension between the physical reality of my body hurts and I groan just getting out of bed (laughs) with, I've got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Because some days, Pastor, they seem a mile apart. I get it. I feel you. I've been there. And we serve a Messiah who has been there. He's a high priest who can identify with us. He's not some distant God who wound up the world and said, best of luck. (laughs) I'm going to go watch reruns. He's right in there with us. So if you have trouble this time of year, maybe it's a difficult time, maybe it's a lonely time, maybe it's a painful memory, and you find yourself kind of in that valley between the two, I want to suggest three things we can do to step into the journey of joy. You know, I always want to leave you with something practical. The first thing seems to be the most simple, but I want you to try this. The first step we need to do is take the time to connect with others. Like-minded believers, connect with others because joy is contagious. Just like fear and negativity is contagious, joy is also contagious. And there may be people that right now are the spark of joy that you are waiting to, to rub elbows with. Think about this. Just last week, when we sent out that cash, and it sent a shockwave through this area, I'm still hearing stories about it. I heard some just this morning. There was a lady who came up and says, we were able to go, went straight to the drive through I had cash, and I said, you know what, I'm going to bless that car. I talked to the lady, and I said, we want to pay for the car behind us. You want to do what? That lady had never had that happen, which is kind of sad in and of itself. But they said, yeah, I want to pay for this car behind us. Can I do that? She said, sure, sure. So I did that. That lady drove off. She didn't get 10 feet away from the car that she had paid for before the heavens opened. The horn started honking, hands out the window. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. you would have thought the lady had, had won the lottery. You know how much her, her bill was? $2.91. $2.91. Yet it changed her day because joy is contagious. You know how I know? Because not only was the one who was blessed smiling and having joy, the one who drove off and got to bless them was also. Now it's two people, two times. And it starts to spread because joy is contagious. There are people, I just got emails just today as I was getting ready to come preach. People saying, you're not going to believe us. I was able to add something to it as a seed, and I'm going to go, and we're going to bless missionaries in Honduras. Man, that's awesome. They don't know what's coming, but it's going to be a blessing, and it's going to spread. And that person's probably going to go and brag on God and say, you won't believe what God did. Isn't he faithful? Isn't God good? And that's what we do, and that's called a testimony. And that's what we're supposed to be doing. So take the time to connect with others. This room is a great place to start. If you need somebody to pray with you, if you need someone to just listen Maybe you want to just worship alongside of This is a great place to start. The second thing, take time, make the choice to be purposefully and intentionally grateful, thankful. The attitude of gratitude. Don't just do it at Thanksgiving. Think about this. Gratitude has a way of reminding us of joy and the reasons we have to rejoice in the midst of pain. This is key. Don't miss this. There is hidden gold in that. The word rejoice, you know what it means? It's the root word joy. But it comes with a prefix, re. You know what that means? This is so cool. It's a verb, but it says we're supposed to practice it, and then we're supposed to go back and repeat it. How did I miss that? Rejoicing. Not just joicing, but rejoicing. Going back and doing it again and repeating it over and over and saying, God, I'm grateful for this. If you struggle with this, here's your challenge. Get you a post-it note, because you're going to fill this up. You don't think you will. It's going to get a bigger piece of paper. And I want you to write down something you're thankful for. Look around the room. Look at your family, look at your job, look at the food in the pantry, look at the clothes, whatever it is, and start writing these down. Your list will grow. And pretty soon you will find your heart starting to stop focusing on your problems, starting to focus on things that you are grateful for. I had a pastor friend challenge and did this. He said, Matt, it was so goofy. I started out a little note, it got bigger and bigger, got a piece of paper. By the end of my time of praising God and finding things to thank him for, I was thanking him for the most bizarre things. I would be writing and I would go, God, I thank you that I have hair still on my body. I thank you, which means a lot to me, and I thank you that the cells in my skin function properly and they adhere together like laminin, and he goes on and on, and he's like, it opened my eyes. You know what I stopped thinking about? My problems. I started thinking, Mike, Lord, forgive me. Shut my mouth if I complain again, because you have given me much to rejoice about. If you do this, do not be surprised if you sense a growing amount of joy filling your heart, which leads us to the third one. Worship God for who he is. Don't just worship God and thank him 
for what he's done, go deeper. Worship God simply for who he is, even in the darkest times, even when the world comes and tries to steal our joy, we still have the privilege to know God, to worship our maker. Oh, that's deep. You do those three things, there is nothing the enemy can do to steal your joy. When you are so focused on him, the world could be on fire. <laughs> Parts of it are. And you could still find a way to rejoice. Man, that is powerful. So my message, my challenge is, what about you? Wherever you are on your journey, will you take the step toward the journey of joy, meeting with your maker, and allow this Christmas spirit to transform you so that you bubble over that joy to someone else, that contagious joy? Let's pray about it. God, I thank you for the privilege to know you, the honor of wearing your name, knowing that our, our, our very names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. That gives us joy. You are so faithful. You are so good. God, I thank you that your joy isn't just for us, but it is for everyone who will receive you. Lord, I pray if there's people hearing this message now that they don't know you, that they would come to receive you, that they would repent of sin and say, I agree with you, God. Holy Spirit, cleanse me. Come into my life. Take up residence. You are the owner of the store. I want to serve you. I want to live a life of purpose. God, I pray that you would break down the walls, the barriers, anything that's in our life that's causing fear, just like the angel that said, do not be afraid, God, help us to take that in, not just as a message for back then, but a message for us today. Draw us to yourself. We draw near to you this Christmas. You are the source of joy, and we pray in your powerful name. Amen.